Hello. Uh, we're going to get started here tonight. Um, my name is Seth Manukin. I'm the director of the Communications Forum. Uh, and a couple of quick announcements before we start. Um, first, communication forums are held three times a semester, six times a year. Uh, if you would like to be informed of future events, there is a sign-up sheet uh, over there. Um, put your name and email, and we will promise that we will only send you uh, news about our six events a year. Um, we have pretty good ones. We had Sarah Vowell earlier this year, John Hodgman last semester, these three. Um, we have some great stuff planned for next semester already. Uh, also, tonight's forum is being filmed by C-SPAN. Um, so during the question part of the, of the forum, uh, if you would go up to one of the microphones um, and also hopefully state your name and your question. Uh, another reason we ask you to state your name is because we then do a write-up of all of the forums afterwards, um, which you will be able to read a couple of days after the event on our website, which is comforum.mit.edu. Uh, and the last announcement uh, is that this event tonight is co-sponsored by Radius, um, which is another group here at MIT. Uh, I am thrilled to be able to uh, introduce these three. It is a different three than we initially thought would be here. Uh, because Jeff Howe, um, uh, is, he called me up at a little past five because his daughter was puking. Um, and uh, as the father of two young kids uh, myself, I said, please stay home. Um, and so fortunately, Chris Couch, who uh, writes a lot about technology, works with the Com Forum, um, is a brilliant journalist in her own right, has agreed to fill in uh, as a moderator. Um, but let me do, introduce everyone. Uh, Noam Cohen um, is the author of the new book, The Know-It-Alls, and that will also be a hashtag tonight and I think moving forward, is that right, Know-It-Alls? Uh, gotta get on that, yep. Uh, Noam and I worked together uh, a decade and a half ago. Um, I've known him uh, ever since. He is uh, a great guy and a, a brilliant journalist. Um, he covered the influence of the internet on the larger culture for the New York Times, where he wrote the link-by-link -link column beginning in 2007. Um, his first book, The Know-It-Alls, The Rise of Silicon Valley is a Political Powerhouse and Social Wrecking Ball, is an intellectual history of Silicon Valley and critically examines how its disruptive culture and ideology belittles civility, empathy, and even democracy. It was published in October 2017, and it is available for purchase right here. Uh, and in addition to, um, to supporting open discussion, we also support uh, both bookstores and authors. So please, by all means, buy the book. It's a great book. Um, Chris and I have both read it and loved it. Uh, um, to Gnome's left is uh, Sarah M. Watson. Um, Sarah is a technology critic who writes and speaks about emerging issues in the intersection of technology, culture, and society. Her work has appeared in The Atlantic, Wired, The Washington Post, Slate, and Motherboard. She's an affiliate with the Berkham Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, and author of the Tau, Tau, or Tau? Tau. Tau uh, Center for Digital Journalism's report on the current state of technology coverage. Um, uh, and then uh, to Gnome's right, to my left now, is uh, Chris Couch. Um, Chris Couch is a science journalist who I have had the absolute pleasure of working with for several years now. Um, she's also the coordinator for the Communications Forum. Uh, her own work explores the intersections of technology and psychology, and her bylines have appeared in Nova Next, MIT Technology Review, Fast Company, Coexist, Science Friday, and Wired Magazine. Um, we have also, for your convenience, put all of their Twitter handles on the board. Uh, at Noam Cohen, at Smwat, S M Watt, <laughs> and at Couch C S. Uh, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Chris. Oh, actually, with further ado, um, sorry about that. In addition to uh, to Noam's book, uh, we have um, a book that Jeff co-wrote with Joey Ito, uh, the head of the MIT Media Lab, um, on sale here called Whiplash, uh, which is also a great book. So both of those are available um, immediately afterwards. And Noam obviously will be here to sign. So 
now without further ado. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you guys all for being here. We're so excited about this panel. Uh, I feel like it addresses a lot of really important issues. Uh, I, too, would encourage you to buy a book. Uh, it's a great book. Um, so first of all, uh, I, I want to kick off this panel by talking about uh, a, the central argument of the book. And correct me if, mm. correct me if I'm wrong here, um, is really the, the disruption and individualism that's very endemic to Silicon Valley has kind of, in a lot of ways, eroded humanity. Uh, is that? Fair to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was thinking about the, the, the question, like the premise of this uh, get together, like, have they lost their humanity? Of course, the glib answer is that they have it. But then the, the you know, deeper question is yeah, every, every person has humanity. So, what, what are we really talking about that's happened? And, and I think it, it I kind of approach some of this from the, the computer science aspect. The book goes a lot of the history of computer science that thinking of people as machines and machines as people is one of the crucial, uh, you know, mistakes or paths that we're on that I think is, is, is scary. So I think that is kind of denying the humanity of your fellow people when you think of them so uh, individualistically as little data points. And I think about like, you know, in the introduction I talk about, it's kind of a well-known anecdote about, you know, Google's uh, first design director who, you know, was asked to you know, create a design for Gmail when they were doing it. And he like, he suggested a color. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it, and they, instead of using the color he wanted, right, they went and, and tested, you know, they A-B tested 41 different shades of blue, and which one, the one that people used the most was the one they were going to choose. And he eventually resigned over the, these kind of issues, saying to be a design director, at least then at Google, was like an oxymoron, to have a human vision for what they were doing when they were going to test it. And, and they don't apologize for that, because basically they say the, the color, the shade of blue we picked is the most popular one. It's led to $200 million in additional revenue. And so I think it's, it's, it's that, that, um, that breakdown of seeing people as data points. And, and I think they're, they're not apologetic about it, but I think it leads to bad outcomes, if that makes sense. Can you speak a little bit to what those outcomes are? I mean, for people that are not familiar with, uh, with you know, the intricacies of Silicon Valley, uh, can you tell me a little bit about how does that play out? Well, right. I guess what I, I was trying to argue is that they are taking this fringe philosophy or ideology called libertarianism and making it seem very normal and mainstream. And so, what do I mean by libertarianism? I mean, you know, resisting regulation, the idea that we should uh, regulate taxis or or hotels, or you know, you can think of all the different companies uh, uh, that we should regulate what children see on video, if not TV. That we should regulate who can pay for political ads. If they should they live in America, should they uh, just declare what they are what they're doing? So that's that's one part of that ideology that the, this, this this distaste for regulation and and distrust of government, which I think is really poisonous to our society. So I, that's one part. I think the extreme idea of free speech is another one. I, I know all these issues are complicated. We'll talk about whether I'm coming out too strong. I mean, to me, uh, I wrote a piece that was in theyorker.com uh, this week about an issue at Stanford and the bulletin board of Stanford and whether you should, even back in the 80s, whether there should be any limits on free speech. So there was a, a joke group that told really virulently racist and sexist jokes. And Stanford tried to limit that, and there was a, such a fierce pushback from the computer science department, the kind of people we're talking about are now are running Silicon Valley, that it, it, was, it was reversed. And like to me, you should, having limits on free speech is vital to having a community that is uh, cohesive. And so I, that's another uh, dangerous aspect of that libertarian ideology. I think they're doing all this in, you know, I think some of it is done in good faith, but I think it's just having horrible consequences. So I wrote this book uh, before the... 2016 election, I was certainly working on it, thinking about it. But I think a lot of what happened there, fruition from that election, bears out these points. Because, you know, the fact that, that these big companies like Google, Facebook, and Twitter are so uh, blase about the idea that a uh, foreign company, a you know, foreign country could try to influence our election, or that there should be disclosure of who's advertising, whether these powerful tools of targeting people should be used by anybody uh, to stir up anger and resentment, to me shows this, this, this disconnect, that they're not, they're not seeing themselves as custodians of this power as they have, but instead are exploiting it for profit or for maybe their kind of utopian visions of, I think like for Mark Zuckerberg, is a, a dream of connecting the world that he thinks supersedes a lot of other mm -hmm. concerns. So. That's, those are sort of the, the, the effects. I would just add one thing, is people will ask me when I've been talking about the book, 
you know, what property to do it, because clearly it wasn't the 2016 election. And I, I, I kind of think about how one thing that was sort of a turning point, and you can look at me as a hypocrite because it's about using Gmail. And I, I remember just thinking that uh, the idea that Gmail would have a computer read your email, which at least, at least it used to do in the past, and in order to place ads for it. I'm, you know, my mom actually you know, passed away from cancer during that time. And I remember thinking how I never mentioned the word cancer in an, in an email because I just didn't want like, hey, have you thought of radiation treatments? Or, you know, I just didn't want that. And that notion that like someone would be a custodian of my information, they're giving it to me for free, and would still feel like they had a right to sort of try to commercialize it was I think a kind of crystallizing moment for me too, if I think back on it. So. so uh, a lot of Sarah's work um, deals with technology criticism, not just of technology itself, but also of the culture surrounding it. Um, I'm wondering if, from your perspective, uh, you know, do you agree with the premise, or how do you feel about the premise, I guess, uh, of, of, of the culture of the technology world having an impact on humanity and empathy and civility? I absolutely agree with, with Noam's kind of overall premise, and I think a lot of people have started to unpack um, the kind of implications of the way that technology is built, but also the kind of assumptions and ideologies that are uh, acted out and in the technology itself. Um, and obviously looking at the individuals who are leading these companies and coming up with these designs and um, looking at their assumptions and their ideologies really do matter. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is, you know, I like to think about this in terms of optimization. Um, I think most Silicon, Silicon Valley leaders and companies are designed around op questions of optimization, whether it's the design itself, whether it's you know getting you the information as fast as you can or connecting people as efficiently as possible or you know connecting you to all of the world's uh, material goods for Amazon. Um, those are kind of questions of efficiency um, and optimizing for profit, right? Um, those are kind of taken for granted as the right terms of optimization. And I think um, trying to unpack what those assumptions are uh, is a really productive starting point to say, OK, well, what if spending more time on Facebook wasn't the optimization model? What if it was a quality experience on Facebook? What would that look like? How would that change the experience? How would that change the design of the platform, but also you know, what would that change about what Facebook's role in our lives is? So I, that's kind of the crux for a lot of the questions that I continue to ask about technology and society. Um, I think that the trick is, you know, using the terminology of the industry, optimization, and the way that they're thinking about problems and problem solving is actually a productive way of like sharing language and trying to get at, you know, we haven't necessarily agreed to the terms of optimization, but they're coming from it at a, at a market perspective, and that's the kind of natural way for things to evolve. Um, but we as a society, we, um, can start to question whether those, those are the terms that we've agreed to or not. Uh, one of the things that um, I, I thought was really well done in the book, uh, the book addresses how uh, many of the issues that we associate with Silicon Valley now and with the larger technology world, uh, issues of privacy, issues of commercialization, uh, issues of um, uh, users being assessed in ways that they may not agree to, um, that, that at least some of the companies that are major giants uh, currently, uh, Google being the one that sticks out in my mind, um, really started with an ethos that was entirely against all of those things. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little bit to, I mean, how did we get here. Sure. I, I want to just pick up like about the. I, I think the, the way Sarah put all that was really uh, spot on. And, and I was reading her report that she wrote, and I think it's she, you know, kind of classifies uh, critics, and and I could see myself in it. I, and I think that what she's talking about is is like a very is practical ways of trying to like get to a better place. And I think in this book, I was sort of looking at the history, like uh, like you're asking, and also trying to ask bigger picture kind of questions. Like I think about the efficiency argument. I, I, it's not in the book, but I was thinking I, I was almost going to make it the uh, kind of beginning of the book is this idea of like gleaners and the idea that in the Bible there's this. Uh, kind of instruction that when you have a field that you should just give it one, go one pass in harvesting it. You shouldn't go back a second time and efficiently get every little fruit and kernel you miss because partly there's an ecosystem of people who are traveling or poor people who live off of the, the, the gleaning. And that, you know, that is an, a metaphor where again, you're saying you know, what the efficient thing would be like, 
I have a farm, I need to get all the content out of it, that's what I do, I'm a farmer. Or you could say, well, you're part of a society and actually the efficient thing is to let some kind of scraps be there for other people because they efficiently use it. You know, again, it's like using their language and thinking about the, the picture there, you know, the, the, the world they're trying to create. And uh, when I, uh, an editor sent me recently a, a, a tweet where someone pointed out that Mark Zuckerberg was saying how he cared so much about this election uh, meddling, the Russian meddling in the election, that he was going to, the company was going to spend all this money to hire uh, people. That's why he mentioned it in, a, in, a, in, a, in an investment call, because it was so important they were prepared to lose money over it. And of course, the natural comment this person made was like, well, you're basically saying you make money from the current bad situation. That's yeah. how important yeah. it is you're going to flip on that one. And so that, that's, again, these efficiencies and the way they're set up that are, are really troubling. About what you're asking about the history, I was trying to look back. I didn't really know these answers. I was learning about how did we get here. That was definitely the question I was trying to ask. And um, in the end, you'll see like kind of a thesis of the book is that the computer science half is, accounts for some, the hacker kind of mentality accounts for some of these extreme ideological ideas about free speech and kind of lack of diversity and hostility to outsiders. And then, you know, I, I kind of credit or blame Stanford for a lot of the the kind of profit seeking. And so, you know, for me, the, uh, the Stanford, the, the Google case was a real, like, just very enlightening, because you go back and read the original papers that, that Sergey Brin and Larry Page wrote when they were developing this, uh, which was really an incredible invention, like the Google search engine or PageRank, you know, I think everyone agrees that they really, you know, maybe they were, they were standing on the shoulders of others, but they really created something that took this chaotic thing called the early web and made it you know, coherent, and it was an incredible, you know, it's the reason why it like became so popular. It's an amazing invention. But they really also explain, as they were describing this amazing invention, why it needed to be advertising free and needed to be in the, in the actual academic world. Uh, that it needed to be a place where it was transparent, there shouldn't be these black boxes. Now, of course, it's, we just come to accept the idea that the Google algorithm and the Facebook algorithm are these secret things and no one should know what they're doing. And I'm sure Sarah could talk about this and that they're constantly tinkering with it in this mysterious way. I mean, they were arguing that's very bad for science. It's very bad for trusting the system because if you don't have any uh, you know, scrutiny of it. And, and so they wrote this paper explaining all that. And at least the way I see the, the story going is that basically they, they are serious academics. Their parents were academics. They were getting PhDs off of this incredible idea they had. And then basically it ended up using so much bandwidth at Stanford that they were told, you have to start figuring out how to pay for this. Now, to me, it's a fair question to say, couldn't Stanford have said, this is a great invention, we're gonna pay for it, of course we're gonna pay for it. We pay for like a nuclear reactor in our, in our building. You know, it's very important for, for our studying of our society and, and science to do this. But instead they were told, you better figure out a way to do this. And they immediately were connected through the Stanford network with an investor like immediately before, so early that they actually didn't, they weren't incorporated. So the story that's told in these books is about how uh, a, a person who, who, who had been at Stanford, a graduate, wrote them a check for Google Inc. And they're like, there is no Google Inc. He's like, there will be. Take the check. You'll need it soon. And like a month later, there was a Google Inc. And they deposited that $100,000 check. And the rest is history. So I do feel like there, there was like a, maybe it's a little corny or something. There's like a corruption or, you know, a, I guess you call it selling out, whatever. There's a corruption mm -hmm. narrative uh, for them and for Facebook as well, where they really had some idealism. They kind of were in awe of the power of computers, and they weren't necessarily trying to become you know, billionaires. That wasn't what that was making them tick. I think in the book, you'll see there are other characters like Peter Thiel and Jeff Bezos who were bankers, and that was really what they were trying to do, was to figure out a way to make money from the internet. But these, I, I, these idealistic hackers, I feel, were kind of led astray a bit. That's my view anyway. Uh, Sarah, you've written extensively about how uh, coverage of the technology world has changed over time. Can you weigh in a little bit about um, you know, how has that, how has the media evolved as the tech world has evolved? Sure. I mean, so in the research report I did for the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia, um, I think one of the things I was trying to look at was, you know, coverage from that kind of early, um, almost breathless uh, excitement about the Silicon Valley moment, the dot-com boom, um, and all of that kind of energy that went into covering before you know the Amazon era, and then later in the Google and Facebook and um, and others era, um, and that kind of starting from a very business oriented coverage model, um, or from a kind of tech blogger model, and so that kind of breathless coverage moving into something a little bit more concerned with you know as the technology 
starts to intersect with a lot of things like politics and people and society, um, those kind of shifting the, the narrative about what matters about technology and why this is changing our lives and affecting our lives. Um, and I think that that shift kind of happens at a couple different points. I think, you know, 2007 or so, the iPhone comes out and like we all of a sudden have dra dramatically changed our like day-to-day -day relationship with a uh, computer in our pocket, basically. Um, so I think, but yet that was still kind of in that gadget uh, excitement phase. Um, and then we have like a 2013-ish moment, which is the Snowden moment. And I think that's kind of where everyone comes to terms with the fact that like technology has both good and bad uses, right? Um, that to me is this like larger discourse moment where everyone, excuse me, specifically journalists and publications are willing to acknowledge that like, yeah, we need to think about this also and hold power to account and, and so on. Um, I think what's really interesting right now, and I think I, I wanted to touch on this a little bit, Nam, because um, right now, there, you know, at this very moment, your book came out. There's um, Franklin Foer's book, The World Without End, which is a little bit more about these companies controlling our access to knowledge and information. Um, there's also The Four by Scott Galloway, which is a lot more about the kind of monopolistic approach of these companies, so a little bit more on the market side of things. Um, but you know, you also have Tim Wu writing about uh, the attention mer merchants, um, talking about you know these companies' uh, monopoly over our our information and our um, attention. So, I think it's an interesting moment right now, in part because like all of these books were being written before the crisis hit. Um, so it's it's fascinating. Like the writing has been on the wall for a long time. Publishers seem to have acknowledged this to think that there was like a market for these books. Um, I, I like to think of a lot of this in a kind of meta, like mm -hmm. where's the audience? Who does this? Who is this for? Wouldn't it fit your narrative that 2013 was a sort of uh, uh, important moment? I, I think about. I wrote a piece earlier than that about uh, this German politician, young guy who who petitioned to get all his data about all the tracking that was done with with him, and it was like, you know, and it, it ran, I think, on the front page of the Times. So, I mean, it was, it was, but it was, again, it, it, you kind of point out in, in your, in that paper you wrote, uh, that so the breakthrough is hard. So, like, it, it's writing an article saying, yeah, isn't that weird? They are keeping all that data about you. But until something like Snowden really, you know, gets attention for a lot of different reasons, it probably takes a while for people to, to see it. So I think that probably was a big trigger, right. yeah. Well, you know. we, we were talking a little bit earlier about the, the problem of access, right? Like, who... For, for a journalist, and mm. I would cu be curious to hear your take on this, is you know, for a journalist to have access to these companies, they have to kind of stay on their good side to, to a degree. Um, and that is especially true if you're like the business um, tech journalist covering the story. So you know, as more kind of journalists from different beats and different walks of life are you know, also coming to terms with technologies of, impact on society, um, the narrative starts to change, right? Yeah, no, I think that's really, I mean, because what you're pointing out is also that one of maybe the benefits from leaving that kind of gadget phase is that that's less important. So I think there was a sense that in, in 2007, like getting access to the first gadget is usually important, but now we are, you know, we're kind of beyond the gadget phase. Now the, the ramifications become as important and the, a well-told story explaining that is very vital. I think there, you know, I didn't, um, seek out a lot of access. I knew that there wouldn't, you know, it wasn't really what they were interested in talking about. And I, I don't know that, I, a lot of them have such, such, uh, there's an incredible site called uh, the Zuckerberg Files where a professor at the University of uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, has just, he kind of, uh, over privacy issues, saying that, you know, they know so much about us, has systematically found everything that Zucker, Mark Zuckerberg's ever said. And he has a, you have to act, you have to like kind of log in with him, but it has access to a, a, a uh, Usually it's videotape of it, you know, a streaming of it, and also text of it. Everything he's ever said since he's 19. And you know, I read a, like a lot of it. I, I mean, I think almost all of it. Uh, and and so likewise, you know, Mark Andreessen, until he deleted all of his tweets, he tweeted 100,000 times. So it's like, you know, there was more than enough about him. And you know, Peter Thiel's written two books. I mean, one book he talks about a lot more than the other one. But there was an early book he wrote that was really, I thought. Uh, re revealing about what his worldview, and you know, so they all had a lot of documentation. So I felt like it wasn't so vital to have an interview uh, with them. When I did try to have interviews, it was often very like uh, meant to be very stenographic, you know, and not not that not that revealing. So um, yeah, I think that there is an appreciation for the deeper journalism, the more critical journalism you're talking about. And I think that's 
it's great. I think it's what we need. But it has to be supported by, you know, the the institutions, the publications, to be willing to stick their neck out and you know put that forward. I, mean, I, I think specifically of the kind of Amazon workplace mm -hmm. environment example, like, you know, the reaction of from Bezos with for that piece was just like, what are you talking about? We're just, fine. Just to fill everybody in, mm -hmm. the New York Times ran a pretty large uh, piece on the inner workings of Amazon employees. And it really spanned from very low level all the way up to uh, high-ish high level. Management. Yeah, middle, sure. middle yeah. management, not all the way to the top. Um, but they really detailed um, the sort of break deck work conditions um, of that place. And it, it ended up getting lots and lots of attention. Yeah, and I felt like the uh, response that, that Bezos gave was a really a classic libertarian response. And like Bezos, obviously, is the owner of the Washington Post. He's considered, some would call him a liberal libertarian, but I mean, I think he embodies a lot of what I'm saying in the book. And his response was very clear that he said, it can't be true because these are people who could go to another company. And if they weren't, uh, if they weren't being treated right, they would just wouldn't work here. So therefore, they are being treated right. And because they do work here, it's kind of the same logic we hear a lot in Silicon Valley that says there can't be, uh, you know, gender, you know, sexual discrimination because there would be these arbitrage opportunities. There would be a company that would take all the great women programmers, and they would be the best company, and therefore it can't exist. The market would would correct for it. So it's that kind of, and I, that is another theme of the book. It's definitely this 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 detachment from reality. The kind of what was when you ask about their intentions, or there's something very seductive about the idea of the internet kind of can erase all of the past. So we don't have to deal with the history of you know, like current racism and, and sexism. It's a new world. And so the, to me, it was a really interesting anecdote. I don't know if it's in the book, but it was about GitHub and how this company, GitHub, had a huge, they're really proud of this, this carpet they had. There was a big symbol of GitHub, and it had meritocracy on it. And they were like, we're so proud. We, we run a meritocracy. And then women were, were walking in and saying, this is really offensive to us. Like, what's offensive? Meritocracy is the great, the best rule. I mean, the best rise up. I mean, and they didn't understand that by writing, by having that as their like slogan, they were in essence saying, what we have now is fair. And if you aren't represented here, that's because you didn't, you didn't make it. You didn't cut it. So that, the idea that, and I think the head of GitHub eventually took the carpet away, but it was like such a re-education for him because it, they really believe the world has been remade because it's a, a, you know, a digital world that none of the, the, the legacy problems that are obviously current don't matter. And so it's a real, uh, yeah. Well, I wanted to dwell on that um, Bezos response because it so clearly articulates this like uh, complete disregard for the physical world. Like they're in Seattle. Like for them to get another Silicon Valley job, they would actually have to uproot their families and lives and everything else. It's not just so. It's not as, you know, uh, not fungible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's I not as fungible as he's yeah. making it out to be. So. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the question is whether it's on purpose or not. Like if he's a smart person and he's saying that, is he, is he really not understand it or is he sort of you know? I, I, but mm. that was always what I always got hung up on. But. When we talk about things like biases in technology, uh, both in terms of biases within the culture of technology, under representation of a number of groups of people, as well as biases that are exhibited by the products themselves, whether that's uh, computer vision systems that have a harder time detecting certain types of skin, or uh, there was an article fairly recently on women having a hard time getting prosthetics that fit because they're largely designed by men. Um, I mean, so many of these problems just stem from you have like a dominant group in power uh, that you have. You have, a, you know, Silicon Valley is so very much dominated by by white men. Um, first of all, from your perspectives, uh, do you see those types of issues changing? Changing over time, or right now, or <laughs> well, now we're talking about it, right? Yeah. I mean, there are these, there are books that are coming out. There is a lot more media coverage on these types of things. I mean, is that landscape beginning to shift, or do you still, do you still see it as we have a really long way to go? Oh, I mean, I, I would say that that um, it, it would require uh, for it to change. I mean, it, it would require the, the the book is is fundamentally saying that. These these companies are anti-democratic. That they are against democracy. They're against. How do we correct in a society for to to have wheelchair access and fill in every blank? Ideally, we have a democracy where people all you know it's not true, but we, ideally everyone gets to express their opinion, and and that is how you represent people. And and uh, 
I, I was struck like Amy Klobuchar, there was a hearing that, that, that the Senate had about the, where they had the, the, the top lawyers, the general counsels for Google, Facebook, and, and uh, Twitter there. And she was sort of explaining to them like very patiently, like we live in a representative democracy. So we really, it's really important that we control our elections. You understand that? Like that's how we do it. And, and, and so I felt like that is like a real like uh, message they don't have. That is fundamentally, how do you assure fairness? Or, you know, we have a democracy. We vote, we, people who are, I, I remember hearing, um, it said that like, that, that like the Japanese internment, maybe if there had been a Japanese American representative, you know, uh, the internment in America of Japanese Americans wouldn't have happened. It, like, you need to have some uh, political uh, way of correcting these things. So I do think fundamentally, as long as they're gonna argue that they can self-regulate and that they are above the government, I, it won't change. So I think the, I'm like kind of optimistic that there could be some sort of a, a wave election that will kind of present a new, new path, but I don't think it can be done by themselves. I think it's, it's the idea of self-regulation is, is it, it, it won't work. I, I don't think that, so. Self-regulation is mm. like 60% of the people that I interview is, is just people who are talking about, well, this is another problem that stems from pure self-regulation within the technology world. I mean, the number of issues that are endemic to that are just, just astronomical. But don't you think it's fair that, it's hard for anyone to regulate themselves. I mean, just right. think about, you know, I mean, I, if I were given free will to like, you know, be in charge of everything, I'm sure I wouldn't be quite as fair. You need checks. I mean, that's like, I, I mean, I do fundamentally believe in democracy. And I think it's a little scary that you get the sense, like, and Peter Thiel is a major, you know, uh, he, I feel like uh, one part, point of this book was to say that Peter Thiel is not an outlier, that it's, that he, he is often described as a sort of fringe character, but that it, it is a, he's really expressing the, the, the main thought there, which is that, you know, that democracy is bad, that like when democracy happens and you have uh, not smart people running the world, and that's not good. And I think they really, but I, I think I really believe that. I remember like there was a person, Max Levchin, who was, who was uh, the co-founder of PayPal with Peter Thiel. I mean, he was sort of saying he believes in regulation, but he doesn't really like politicians. And like, you know, uh, so it's like they kind of, they just think it's not efficient or, I don't know. So I mean, that's what, I do think it gets down to our democracy though, and it is really important. That's why I wrote the book, I mean. Uh, Sarah, you've written about how um, specifically within technology criticisms, uh, that that world is also in certain ways very reflective of technology and that uh, female voices, voices of uh, minority writers uh, have been overlooked um, in, an, in a systemic way. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, do you see that end of it changing at all? I absolutely do see that changing, um, which is part of why I was looking at this kind of larger ecosystem of people who are writing about these things. Mm -hmm. um, I think certainly in the last couple of years that it has drastically changed, which is all for the better. I think that also has put pressure on Silicon Valley to change. Um, so at the very least, so speaking of like how ver now versus in the future, um, I think we've at least seen the kind of oh yes, we will work on diversity for hiring. We'll work on you know, thinking more about users' interests and needs. Um, whether or not that's actually being effective is another question. Um, on the kind of writing side of it, I think you know, I, I was really interested in looking not just at a set of people who are like covering technology, but the rest of the people who are also contributing to a larger discourse about the role of technology in society. And so some of that has to do with looking at a whole range of writers, not just technology journalists whose like, beat is technology, but it's the people who think of themselves as critics, people who are you know, just writing an op-ed because they, their academic work um, has a direct response to you know, the current issue on Russia, for example. Um, so my interest was in, to, in trying to articulate this larger ecosystem of people who are contributing. And a lot of that has to do with you know, women writing blog posts about you know, terrible things either happening at their workplace or um, critiquing a technology that doesn't include um, you know, fitness tracking, it, it, the iPhone not having a menstruation tracker. Um, you know, those kinds of pieces are um, coming from a lot of different directions, from a lot of different disciplinary backgrounds, um, and uh, existing in a lot of different places. And so obviously that's not limited to publications, but I think what's what is frustrating is that a majority of the kind of traditional ways and places that you would look for technology coverage um, for a long time still were dominated by, you know, your standard tech white dude bro. 
Sorry, no. <laughs> no, I hear you. And, I, and, and as you're pointing out, like just hearing the list of things you're you're mentioning, and even the thing I'm talking about, GitHub, that was a, a, a woman who was blogging that. In right. fact, she had a bad encounter with Mark Andreessen over it, and that's sort of why I kind of stumbled on it. So, I, and yeah, I, there are things that no matter how enlightened you are, that it's not you're not going to be able to do that. We were. I wonder if you like look at the example of. Uh, all the coverage of the harassment in the media, particularly, and look at and a lot of that are, are women journalists who are writing that, and mm -hmm. are. Uh, I mean, is that like a a reason for like hope? Imagine if there were similar kind of um, kind of push going on about that with the way uh, the way Silicon Valley works, written by women journalists who. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm certainly like, especially in this current like in the last two you know two months moment, um, I'm hopeful. I think when you look back at like what Ellen Powell went through with her, I think it was Kleiner Perkins mm -hmm. um, lawsuit, oh, yeah. talking yeah. about explaining. Yeah, yeah so um, Ellen Powell had a, um, I guess she was in a VC company, uh, Kleiner Perkins, yeah. right? Um, and had a sexual harassment issue. And that kind of just got shoved under the, the, the rug, basically. Um, but that, again, was you know probably two years ago at this point. Mm -hmm. um, she now has a book out mm -hmm. that is all about her, you know, follow through on what to do about this um, kind of systemic sexism and um, not having an ability to have um, support and have people take her seriously, um, take her claim seriously. So I wonder what you thought of that. That uh, I'm not going to remember the guy's name exactly. The Google uh, engineer who, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, because a lot of people look at me and go like, "Look what Google did. They they fired this guy." You know, uh, James Damore. Yeah, James Damore. And like, so you're sitting there saying that they're they're libertarians, but in fact, they fired this libertarian uh, guy for his, you know, for really uh, uh, for his like insidious ideas and what he put there. And uh, I wonder how do you, you how do you see that? Like, because some ways it was like a PR. Um, yeah, James Damore. For tell you. those who don't know, is the author of the infamous 10-page Google memo. Um, it included a pretty large critique of Google's internal culture and included uh, it, some information uh, stating that women might be naturally inclined to, to be less biologically, suited, yes. biologically yeah. less inclined uh, to for uh, coding yeah. than men. So it went over super well. <laughs> um, and, and, and he ended up get, getting fired, and then he went on a fairly large PR push um, after that, saying that you know it was his like autism spectrum that like led him to believe this. Um, and was free one, speech. Well, I yeah, was saying right, that right. Is why, why is any idea? I, I remember seeing someone on Twitter saying you know Charles Darwin couldn't work at Google, and I'm sitting there thinking like you know. Uh, there's so, I mean, the problem is that like Google is now a company that isn't just doing programming. That would be bad enough. The computer lab being uh, so non-diverse is bad. But this is actually affecting our society. So really, you, you, even Charles Darwin couldn't do other. I mean, you, there, there's so many roles to be played at Google. It's just, it's, it's just a very weird way of defining what, uh, what it means to be a, a tech worker. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, but the, I mean, the interesting thing on the kind of free speech side of it was fascinating to me because it was so much like. I should be able to say what I think, and yes, that's true in a kind of public forum, but this is actually within the company, and the company basically saying like, well, yes, you have free speech, but we can also decide to fire you. Like, that doesn't preclude you from, you know, you don't fit in our culture anymore, um, which I think is fascinating that we have reached a point that Google can say that that's not what their culture is or what they don't, what they don't want their culture to be like. Or perceived um, as, anyway, yeah. Sure, yeah. right. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's still indicative of this, you know, engineering mentality of just like very transactional, like very data-driven assumption, or, uh, you know, backing of, of an idea and saying like, this is the way the world works and all of these kind of more just uh, interventions are not valuable in his mind. I think that there is also, as far as uh, biases within tech culture, within tech products go, uh, there is a very valid argument that uh, as technology increases, as we become more reliant on automation, on algorithms, that biases that once you might once be able to hold somebody responsible for, say, hiring only men or hiring uh, whoever, that, that if an algorithm is doing it, now you're losing that person to hold somebody accountable to. Uh, can you? 
would you guys mind um, talking a little bit about the role that explainability and transparency might, might play with some of these issues? Sure, yeah, I, I mean, I think there, there's, uh, this great interest in like, okay, well, we'll let the like HR algorithm system do the work, and like then we have to say that it's not biased because because it's you know, science. Well, and it's not a human deciding, right. so haha. -ha. Um, <laughs> but then of course, you know, what are you optimizing for? This gets back to my main question, which is okay, success. If you're if you're building this algorithm to say like what a successful person at Google looks like then you're already baking in a lot of assumptions about their background, their um, history, their um, schooling, all of these things that continue systemic you know, injustices in the sense that you, know, you don't have access or you don't have um, the right background or you are just not a white man who gets along in his you know, coding uh, cohort. So I, I, I mean, I think there are a lot of people talking about this, especially in the kind of AI right. um, ethics. And shout out to Berkman Klein Center and MIT for um, some of their work on this, um, on kind of accountability of algorithms and saying, you know, these are yes, they are objective, and yes, they are outsourcing the decision making process. But looking into what the terms are really does matter, and I think that's still a hard, a hard conversation. Yeah, I, I mean, I was like, there was a footnote in a book that Sherry Turkle wrote that was, I, I kind of went back a lot and looked at AI. The, one of the main, one of the chapters is about uh, a guy named John McCarthy who was a professor at MIT and then he moved to Stanford and he's the one who came up with the term AI and he was an early uh, computer science, you know, pioneer, but also an AI pioneer. And um, so the whole, I was really interested in the whole quest to, to create a thinking being Again, the idea of thinking of people as machines, machines as people, thinking that a brain itself is an entity that could exist outside of a body. Just a, a lot of, uh, it, it really was, a, a to me, a very odd and revealing quest that these early computer science pioneers had. And so Sherry Turkle had, so one of the, a, a key scene in the book is between the debate between John McCarthy and, and this professor at MIT and Joseph Weizenbaum uh, over whether a computer could be a judge. And they're like, uh, they're really very, uh, you know, they're very argued a lot all the time. They were, I'm almost made they appeared in debates a lot against each other. And McCarthy was like, of course a computer could be a judge. A computer can do anything as long as it's programmed correctly and has all the information it needs. Why couldn't it do anything? And, and to Weizenbaum, who was a refugee from Nazi Germany, that was a really obscene, that was where he was, obscene idea that you take something as human, you know, again, the loss of humanity, as humane as being a judge or being a therapist and thinking that that could be performed by a computer was a, just a real disconnect with reality. So, and, and Sherry Turkle had this uh, a footnote uh, on that exact topic. I think she knew why, knows why, knew why Zimbabwe before he died. And um, it was about how he, she interviewed uh, minority students at MIT like in the early 80s, and, and they were very uh, encouraging of the idea of, of a judge being a, a, a program, of a computerized judge, because they thought, you know, we know judges are biased and horrible, and this computer will be fair. And I think it was like the era when they really believed com you know, computers could actually be these separate entities, and there would be this, like, thinking being. And then, you know, cut to 10 years later, and then, you know, the, the view entirely switched, because they realized that basically it's being given this garbage information about how judges rule in reality. What's it going to learn? How would it be different than, the, any better than what it's learning from, the kind of the machine learning argument. So I, I, all a long way of saying that like that these, these computers are neither good or bad. Obviously, the people who use them, that's the problem. And what their information they're given, they're not going to be any better than our society. How, why would they be? Again, it's this fiction that the computer world is separate from the real world. It's like it's a product of the world. And if we have a racist, sexist society, it's not going to fix that problem. How could it? And I think of one quote that Weizenbaum said, which was that, which was kind of a, carried over in the whole book, was the idea that a lot of the problems that these people, the computer programmers are, think that they're so great at math and they should be solving all these other problems. He's like, math is easy, at least for him it was. But like actually solving injustice or writing a poem, like that's hard. So it's that fundamental disconnect of thinking that if you're good at programming or math that you actually should run our society. When we know how hard it is to fix our society is the fundamental problem, I'd say. Do you feel that that technology has any role to play in terms of correcting, correcting these issues? 
Then I, you know, to contradict myself, I think there was this famous, uh, well, there was this famous court case in the 80s, which was arguing that, that the death penalty should be ruled, uh, you know, invalid because it showed systemic bias. So obviously, I think data and showing systemic bias can be very enlightening uh, to the public. So I think, you, you know, and, and the court ended up not using that and, and didn't, basically said you have to prove that there was racism in each case. You can't have some systemic argument that our criminal justice system is unfair. I've proven it with, with data, so we should fix it. Uh, so I mean, I, I, on the other hand, I do think data could really enlighten us about how, how uh, unjust our society is and what we should work on fixing. But I don't think you know, a program is going to do that. Does that make sense? I don't know. I mean, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, this leads into kind of a bigger question I had following up on the book, which is, you know, I think you do an amazing job of kind of articulating the, the ideology and the history of where these concepts are coming from and the kind of hacker mentality butting up against the entrepreneurial model. Um, but what I was left wanting more of was like, okay, so, so what? And also, what do we do? Right. Um, right. And I think one of the, so I, I kind of always go back to Lawrence Lessig's um, four uh, points of what we do to change things. Um, this, he wrote a, this um, in Code um, and Code to, to a long time ago. And so one of those things is, okay, we can, we can decide what the technology is optimizing for. We can decide you know, what terms we're um, either designing the algorithms for or um, kind of what direction we're leading for. And that still goes back to the question of, you know, is it optimization towards efficiency or optimization towards justice, right? Um, but I think there's still other parts that we could start to unpack, like, okay, if the libertarian approach is a problem or the mentality that like this has led to huge monopoly systems, right? Um, we can start talking about, uh, you know, markets seems to be one of the, so Lawrence Lessig's model has markets, code, law, and norms are the four kind of ways that one could, or the levers that one could change um, society or change where things are going. Um, I, I'm like hesitant to say that markets seems to not be a real possibility here. Like we have ended up in a monopoly situation. Network effects basically mean that the market lever is kind of impossible, right? Like, do we have an alternative to Facebook? Do we have an al alternative to Google? Do we have an alternative to Amazon, right? Kind of, yes, but not really at the scale that these companies are operating at. Um, which is why we kind of get back to the regulation problem. That's the law piece. Um, I'm scared because that's certainly not going to be a functional lever for the, le the next four years, um, at least. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, even looking to the net neutrality moment, we're, you know, rescinding all net neutrality um, limitations. Um, antitrust is still not really uh, set to address the way that these tech companies are set up. Um, it doesn't really apply to free services either, right? Like the, the standard ways that we look at antitrust, which are like, competition, pricing, um, harm to the consumer, right? These kind of don't work. Um, and so I, I, I think we have to think about other ways to hold these companies accountable, but that has to evolve into some new model that's not you know, based on our old, our old levers. Well, norms, I think, are something, right? You're, we're certainly seeing, you know, if we're seeing what happened with Sexual harassment and the public, mm -hmm. pub, that's a norms kind of kicking in in a way. Mm -hmm. And I um, and I guess I am leery of the idea of code ever being useful because, again, it's like not, not, not knowing what you don't know. So, I mean, like a well intentioned male programmer you may not think of a menstruation, you know, uh, calendar. It's like, it, 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 and it isn't even, it's just like not, yeah, it's not, it won't be a viable uh, solution. So, I do have to, you know, so you say, and certainly, as you mentioned in your report too that like the idea of what do we do now is always a uh, a big you know a big question. And, and you know, I think there are characters in your paper who talk about how hey, I'm I'm pointing out all the problems. Give me credit for that. I don't have you know solutions. That's you know not my department, as uh, <laughs> as they say. And um, so, but I do I did try. And, and and the arguments I were making were that smaller local things. The points you're kind of making that are that need to be fixed. I was thinking though that like the power of narrative that. 
maybe a, a mistake I, I made in the book, and maybe now I try to talk about more, is, is to sort of embrace this sort of individualism argument and the, because I do believe in individualism and, 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 and people, you know, self-actualizing, getting the most out of their lives. And maybe the way to think of it is, is the way the data is, that people should have a right to their data and that that is like a way of framing it, that, that something is like gone off the rails, that, that it was just considered uh, normal for these companies to collect everything about you. And even though they're giving you the services in exchange, it's not really done in a very transparent way. And it's just fundamentally wrong. I, I, I mean, all I can fall back are these like analogies that like, imagine if you walk into a store and someone follows you and go, oh, uh, oh, did you buy that? That's interesting. I'll go tell, I'll make a dossier about you. And like, I mean, it would be like unthinkable. Why? It would be a norm. I don't know. I mean, like people point out that like, that, um, you know, maybe an efficient thing is to go to a store and you see that take a penny, add a penny, and go mm -hmm. take 55 cents and go, what can I buy with this? I mean, that is, did I break a rule? I don't know, but it's not our norm. It's not how we behave. So I think partly, maybe I'm, I am hoping for uh, a, a, a norm, norming a, a, away from these, these beliefs and, and a belief that we as a society, if it's still possible, to come together and make better rules. So I, that's all I can fall back on and have certain values like your data is yours. and and. And partly, I think liber libertarianism is one the day because even the way you frame it with Snowden, you know, I, in my gut, I feel like if, if Google and Facebook and these other companies hadn't collected so much data to start, the government would never have dreamed of it. It's like it, they, they, were the, they are the custodians of, of all this material, and they abuse that. And that's like set us on a very wrong path, and we have to get back from that path. I've certainly, wasn't there someone, the CIA director, or someone who was saying how Facebook has a better dossiers on people than we ever could do? Because it wouldn't work, a government like coming there and saying, tell us everything you bought and what you like. It just wouldn't, you know, it would be, it would raise, raise your antenna. So I think we, we need to try to get back our control our society. I, it's a pretty open-ended comment, but. But even, even if that's, and I totally agree with that mm -hmm. as a direction, I still wonder, like, how does that actualize? Mm -hmm. Like, does that mean we stop using Facebook? Does that mean we don't let Facebook do certain things? Does that mean we demand certain features and, and protections of these companies? Um, does that mean we have a, co like, collective action um, movement about, mm -hmm. like, you know, fuck the default or mm -hmm. some, some kind of way of getting into... Uh, the 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 way to change it right like yeah because right. it's it's one thing to say yes I need to have access to my data or have ownership of my experience or you know be able to voice my interests and needs to determine the way that my newsfeed is filtered right yeah. like we don't even get to do You're that saying make a Facebook group about this right now let's get <laughs> on it I'm with you uh, no I right you like know, does it take a movement or yeah or I do something? think it takes a movement I do think you're pointing out like things like Snowden I think the election are going to be galvanizing moments. And I was struck watching this hearing that I watched uh, to comment about uh, about the, uh, the Senate Judiciary hearing that there was, uh, it was the, the sharpest questioner was this uh, Senator Republican from Louisiana, John Kennedy, who asked just pointed, the best, most pointed questions about what's going on. Like, uh, does, could Facebook, you know, give me a list if I'm an advertiser, people are depressed, and could I sell them alcohol? Could I, you know, do you know who's overweight and you know, I sell them diet pills? Or you, he, asked, and I, I, it's like it should transcend, you know, petty partisan politics. I don't think it should transcend like, you know, greed versus not greed. Or, but I think that, you know, middle America is definitely the one that's being hit hardest by all this. It's their, their, their wealth is being taken and being sent to the coasts, you know, by and large. So I think there is a chance for a genuine movement. I mean, if there is this, you know, belief in our political system that, there, I do think that something could change. I think things are galvanizing. I'm hopeful. I mean, well, even in mm. that case, I mm. think that's one of those. Okay, so if we're gonna define what our norms are, we at least have to have all these examples and all these cases of saying, like, yes, this is a possible way that this advertising mm. platform could be used. And oh, by the way, we don't believe that that's an appropriate use, right? Mm. I think it has taken us a long, long time to get enough of those examples and enough of those understandings of how those systems work and what they're capable of and how advertisers are using them, for example, um, to even begin to establish uh, a threshold of what we are defining as appropriate or not appropriate. And for the most part, all of that is kind of hidden. 
Yeah, but it's heartening that like the senator, I, he, I hadn't thought of it. I didn't articulate it nearly as well as that. Like mm -hmm. he went right at him, and it was they were just kind of hemming and hawing as they they really. It was like you know, very concrete. It yeah. was very. It was great. I, it, it was really impressive. So I, you know, I mean. There is a sense that, yeah, that maybe that is sort of the more of a burden, and maybe that's what you're saying that the book, or the next thing I have to do is to really be more concrete and more uh, galvanizing that way. I wanted to just tell the history, because I was really, like what Chris was saying was like, I wanted to just sort of say, how did we get here? Because I, I was genuinely like baffled, and I kind of came at this stuff with a lot of optimism. And Wikipedia is like a real uh, uh, obsession of mine. Like I, I wrote many, many articles about it for the Times. I really saw that as like an incredible, like anarchic, uh, you know, some of these little parts become this incredible thing. And I, so I, I do have a lot of optimism about it. I more was just trying to answer that question, how did we get here, more than like, how can we get it back? But that is definitely the next like question, I think. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have to open this up for questions in just a minute. Uh, I'm gonna ask one last question. And then if anybody in the audience would like to ask questions, uh, please go to one of these two microphones here. Uh, we would love to, to hear from you. Because we are at MIT, uh, I am obligated to ask, uh, you know, what, what role does the university have for students who are here, who are designing things, who are making their own startups? You know, what ethical considerations should they be thinking of before moving into the real world? Wow, I mean, because uh, we're kind of saying how the deck is so stacked, uh, you know, and not that you want to say it to young people. Um, I guess, I mean, there is a, when I was sort of advocating for local, you know, there's a certain tend to your own garden and like trying to create, uh, I would think there must be a real uh, thrill in like trying to create a small uh, project that can have better values, maybe not be driven by the market and, and seeing that come to fruition. And um, I do think there's got to be a way to, uh, you know, not to sort of view, the, what they're basically saying now, because of the monopoly we're system we're living with now, that even new companies are just only looking to be acquired. And so I would say that that, you know, I mean, who am I to sit there and say, don't like seek your billions, but, uh, or your millions, but like that would be the message. Try, try to nurture something that, that is smaller. I think there is like a real yearning for it. I mean. But even if, if somebody is seeking their, their billions, mm -hmm. um, which is, Weird that it, that's accurate here. Mm. Um, it strikes me as very strange. Uh, what should they be thinking of before, on when they're on that path? Like, what questions do you feel that MIT students should be asking when they're building their groundbreaking technologies? I mean, I think the hardest question to always answer is, you know, you have one intention for this technology, whatever it is that you're building how to recognize the myriad ways that the same technology could be used. Mm -hmm. um, that's always a really hard question to answer until somebody has discovered some other way to use it or to monetize it or to apply it to you know, weapons and, and mil military industrial complex, right? So I think that's probably, like learning how to see your own um, effort from multiple angles and like from interrogate multiple your own idea. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah, really, and yeah. run it by so many different people, right? Like that's the thing I think that's missing from a lot of what happens in Silicon Valley is like how much user testing do they really do where a user gets to tell them how they feel? They do so much A/B testing, but does that ever tell you what my intention was as a user, my experience, my emotions, all of these things? Aren't you basically saying right now they're just using the market as their as the only way to sort of see what the intent, you know, and they'll throw something out and it's pivoting, right? They call well, it like, so I'll pivot, assumptions. yeah. There's so many assumptions in the way that most of these technologies are operating, that, and that's kind of by design, right? Like, the data-driven approach is that we can look at what the d behavioral data is and then determine, like, what's going to get you to spend more time or what's going to get you to spend more money. Um, and that doesn't get into anything about, like, what my actual intentions are. So... Yeah, try talk guess, to, actually talk to people. <laughs> yeah, I would say fo forging real connections instead of for virtual ones would be a real way to interrogate your idea. Because I think even even you know Mark Zuckerberg's coming around the idea that, that there's more to there has to be some real uh, basis to these relationships. Otherwise, it doesn't. It's I not would, good for can us. Can I yeah. add one more thing? Mm. Which is I I think so much of what we're talking about is like the leadership role that you know these individual, especially in the way that you've I structured the book, yeah. is like the men who are in charge who you know have these ideologies but you know that filters into the culture of these companies and it's actually i think it's really imperative to think about the more systemic contextual um, way that this these ideas get played out and you know 
how that is baked into what your um, your you know engineering goals are, your um, your efficiency, your like how how is your job um, you know checked right? Like, what's your performance review? Um, having some control over those questions seems to be another way that we could like cut into you know the the overall culture. All right. We are going to open this up to audience questions now. Uh, if you would like to ask, um, please use one of these microphones. Uh, please be kind. And we're going to switch off from one to the other. Uh, we'll start at this one over here. And then next one is coming over to you. Hi. Um, my, my name is Nina Litton. I'm here from the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard and the Humanist Hub in Harvard Square. So thank you so much to Radius and the folks for bringing this important topic out in the open. I wanted to ask the, the question about the, um, Sarah, you had mentioned that the, the technologies don't take people's feelings into account. And I wanted to say, uh, from a, an ethical perspective, as I experience it, I believe the use of the, the emotions, you know, like and anger, that is a proxy for hooking into the dopamine circuits and creating an addictive experience, mm -hmm. which, excuse me if my voice is breaking, I think is very unethical. And I wonder what your feelings would be about how to answer, how to bring these, you know, bring this to awareness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That That's this, you know, this is like whiskey and cigarettes and right. the rest of it. Right. Yeah. How do we regulate those kinds of things? That's a great question. Um, there's a couple things. One is, you know, there are already engineers and designers who are recognizing that. I mean, that's, this again gets back to the optimization question: Are you? Is it really just to get you to keep thro scrolling through and auto refreshing and you know infinite feed, right? Um, Tristan Harris is um, one of these engineers and designers, former Google um, person, who is working on the question of time well spent. So timewellspent.io. Um, and that's really driven by this um, kind of, OK, we're engineers and designers. Like, we can design these systems in better ways. Um, on the addiction side of things, um, I really love, um, I think she used to be at MIT. Now she's at NYU. But Natasha Dow Schul's work, um, she has a book called Addiction by Design. Um, and it's, it's actually about slot machines, but is, of course, um, very relevant to the design of any technological interface. Um, and yeah, she's very clearly articulating this as like these systems are designed to keep you in flow, keep you um, going, not necessarily to keep you winning. Um, and that's kind of a really interesting um, look at specifically such a clear use of addiction. But um, people are, have you know, naturally taken that and applied it to um, these more con kind of broad consumer interfaces. Hello, my name is Elliot Owen. I was born and raised in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, come from all this stuff. And yeah, there's a lot of complexity there. There's plenty of good things, there's plenty of bad things. I think one thing that really struck me was your argument about inefficiency of if you have some large corporation efficiently optimizing to take over some market or some product, whatever it is, and you're squeezing out maybe the small people who live on the crumbs. Um, I see also like a flip side. I can argue, um, you know, when you pay a medical bill, who's still advocating for inefficiency when we have trillions of dollars of waste in the healthcare industry? And it goes both ways. There's like a huge cost to inefficiency, and there's also a huge cost to the people that you squeeze out there. And so I'm trying to think, if, if you had a tech company go through and try to you know, completely redo healthcare and make it a very efficient system, you might be able to save trillions of dollars. But what would happen to all the people who you know, got squeezed out from that system? And I think it's, you can't really paint it in black and white either way. They're just, there's just trade-offs. Yeah, I would think and having universal health care is, is a much more important goal than either one of those things, you know, so in my opinion. So, I mean, I, I totally hear you. And, and of course, it's like a, there's a reason why these companies are successful and, and they're popular because there, there was a need for efficiency and, and to, for hailing cars or for shopping. And so uh, I guess we're just sort of saying it needs to have a, a, a higher goal. I think the way Sarah is like framing it is really well, is really good that like, you know, the idea of 
if your goal is just to maximize profit, that is not a good goal. So that could explain why you'd want people to be addicted because it maximizes your profit, but it's not good for society. And maybe another way of thinking besides the gleaner analogy is to think of it as just like a pollution. The way the first question is that, that th these are, you know, she's mentioning alcohol companies, tobacco companies. They also are giving people what they want. They're very popular. I mean, it's like, that's not the only way you judge these things. So I, I, I think it, we need to have, of course, the enthusiasm and the creativity is really vital to our society, but if it doesn't have some kind of larger goal, we're, we're going to have a problem. I and mean, we are having a problem. I, mean, I would also follow up just the idea that, you know, why hasn't Silicon Valley completely disrupted the healthcare industry yet? And I think it really comes down to the allergy to a highly regulated um, <laughs> ecosystem, right? Like, wow. that is so far down the road of like, we just aren't gonna touch that. I mean, I, looking at the quantified self community um, and quantified self devices, um, you know, none of those are medical devices for a reason. Those are trackers um, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah the, right. The, uh, so if you yeah. Tell, oh, yeah, I never heard that term before. Oh. Is. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, trackers, you know, Fitbits. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these companies like wanted to start getting into the, what's the tri-coder, like, let me scan your face and see if you have a uh, like Star Trek if I'm vision. Gay or what? No, oh, no, no, no. Oh, oh. For like how sick you are, and oh. you know, oh. to have a checkup that's mm. just like <laughs> like checkup in in five seconds, right? Um, the reason that that company is kind of you probably haven't heard of it is that you know they've gotten so far back with FDA approvals and things like that. So what do you so. make of the life hacking stuff and the sort of like the blood transfusions and the. Uh, you know, because uh, that's also part of that culture. To me, again, I was, you talk about you writing, you think on a meta level. I was trying to think about like the idea of, to me it was related to the idea of creating artificial intelligence and the idea of kind of giving birth to yourself and not ever dying and sort of being again detached from reality and thinking of your brain as something that could be on the cloud that lives forever. So that's how I viewed it in, in, that, con in that kind of context of the, the ideologies of, of, that led to computer science. How, how do you see that? Uh, the biohacking. Yeah, kind of that kind of things. stuff. Yeah. And the, is that medical or, or is that well, data? Well, oh. I mean, certainly, but then, mm. you know, you've got a lot of hacker types who are, you know, willing to experiment on their bodies and just think, they, there's something about thinking differently about your, like, corporeal place in the world and, you know, whether or not that's a sacred thing or not, you know, that, that's getting, <laughs> getting in, deep in the weeds, but. Thank you so much. Hello, uh, thank you for the engaging discussion. Um, my name is Murthy, I'm a, a graduate student in mechanical engineering. Um, so I grew up in India and uh, the one thing that really struck me uh, when once I moved here was the commitment to free speech and the protection of First Amendment that the Supreme Court has provided in this country, which is unparalleled in my opinion. So I was really taken aback when you mentioned free speech as a libertarian value, which I think is as much a liberal or conservative value. and. I wonder what you mean uh, by abuse of free speech. Of course, internet is not the best place for, for uh, uh, cordial discussions, and we all know that. But how do you think we can really maintain the spirit of the First Amendment going ahead? Right, and obviously this is something people argue about. I mean, you could argue uh, limiting the amount of people can donate to campaigns is a restriction on free speech, and we currently live in a Supreme Court that thinks that any rich person will be able to give as much money as possible to affect an election, and that's that is their freedom. And co you know, corporations are corporations people. people are people as well, and For and, and, and and so I mean that either could be a very enlightening. Uh, I, I see why I actually thought the the Russian meddling in our election was really revealing, is because it really put the lie to that argument of ultimate free speech. Because if you really believe free speech is just an absolute, and it's just. All, all that these Russian outlets or any other meddlers were doing were putting words and pictures together. What's the problem? What, what, what's the problem with and, and antagonizing people or, or getting people uh, to hate each other? It's just words and pictures. But obviously, they are there. There's a sort of there's a consensus I think in our country that that was a bad thing. And maybe our president doesn't agree, but almost everyone else agrees that that was a bad thing to have a foreign country try to stir up antagonism among our our people and to try to pick a winner of our election. So that would be a limit on free speech at one level, but to me that seems a very necessary one. So I totally hear you. I, I want people to express themselves, and you know that's hard to, to, to belittle that, and I understand that if you live in a society where you can't do that, how harmful that is, but there are real uh, costs to, you know, and, and in essence, like places like Twitter are, are allowing incredible 
it isn't random uh, anger. It's anger directed at certain groups. It's like you have to sort of, again, look at it in actual historical context. I mean, that's how I would argue. And that, that it's almost like thinking of his code to think of that, that this thing called the ultimate free speech is just going to work because it's the right thing to do and not recognize all the actual real, real effects. I mean, that's my view of it. I mean, yeah, I mean, I would add, especially in the Twitter context, I think they've done so much to protect free speech that they do that it hampers them from addressing very serious things and behaviors like harassment and you know how to embed uh, checks on that kind of behavior in the system. Um, I think they've done a whole lot and tried to do a whole lot so far, but um, I think there are a lot of people who are really underwhelmed by. Um, how that gets manifest in the code and how, you know, as a user who's being harassed, like what are your, what can you do aside from just blocking all these, you know, And part of it again is the scaling idea that it should be automated instead of that, right. you know, if we were living in a, a normal society, if you were somewhere really picking on someone in a harsh way, we would sort of say, don't do that. And I would say, you say, it's my freedom to yell at this one person, and make them feel really uncomfortable so they'll run away. But we would say, no, don't do that. I mean, you know, I mean, that's like, that's the fundamental. And when you sort of abstract it to this level, it's my speech rights, it becomes, you know, uh, I think dangerous. I mean, that's, but I totally hear your point. I mean, I, just, I guess we disagree. Hi, I'm a humanities graduate student at MIT. I'm also a six year moderator on Reddit. so. Nice piggybacking off of that question. Where do you view, you know, uh, you talked a lot about governance and in your reply to the last question, you know, you mentioned that these companies believe that uh, all of these regulatory behaviors should be algorithmically controlled or administered. But the fact is that they still rely quite heavily on human moderation, whether it's commercial or volunteer, like such as in my case. So what do you see as the current place and possibly future potential of human moderation, be it commercial or volunteer, within these online social spaces? Yeah, I naturally fall back to Wikipedia, which does a lot of, uh, I think they do some automated uh, policing, but they do a lot of uh, human volunteers. And I think it, it, fundamentally it has to be human. I think that's the sort of, when we talk about what's bad about big, it's not just the monopoly part. It's that it is not human. It's not human scale. And I remember uh, there was a book uh, called The Boy Kings. It, it, I remember, yeah, and so and she said a beautiful description about how like the scalability was just the most important thing, just growing fast. And scalability really meant you couldn't be human, human uh, customer service. It was just removing people out of it. And that's just fundamentally, Wikipedia's managed to grow uh, quite big, but not billions, uh, by using people who are very motivated to do the right thing. So I, yeah, I think it's kind of vital that you have to have a, a human uh, a community that will respond. I mean, I think it's like vital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it, it gets back to the norms question as well uh, as to you know, who's determining how norms are expressed for algorithms or for you know, automated platforms, right? Um, that's a pretty hard question. So yeah, that's where the, the interplay between technology and humans or you know, the filter through the algorithm but then have a human look at it. And I, I, kind of stand on the side of, you know, I think we're going to be working alongside of technologies and AIs and whatever else for a long time. And it's not just going to be a either or, it's going to be both. Hi. Um, so uh, my name is Ines. I'm a postdoc at MIT and a social scientist by training. And um, I guess so I look at this conversation and your book actually from the perspective of both a political scientist and uh, a European, I guess, right? And we do have uh, slightly different standards. And in a way, I cannot help but sort of want to ask you, where do you see the political system, you know, in all of this? Because ultimately, I would argue that, you know, what we see in terms of, because uh, you take sort of a in, very individualistic uh, sort of approach, explanatory approach, which is valid and very interesting. But I would argue that ultimately, this is about, you know, how much, uh, influence do we want to give government and how much influence do we want to have our, on our own and that's why we have you know like the german the german court case or why we have the european commission you know being very explicit about the use of cookies right now so if you could elaborate a little bit on yeah, this yeah i do think I, in the book i definitely hold up europe as a model that way I, again it's the idea of the individual like it's hard to know what you're you're describing that as individuality because the government is protecting individuals but i think in america they'd be like how dare the government be involved in protecting me you know i mean so that's the 
kind of catch-22 here. In America, when we frame it that way, look how, isn't it great? we got all these rules so we protect individuals. People are like, get the government off my back. You know, get, get the government off my Medicaid. You know, I mean, it's like they don't, people don't really appreciate what is uh, being done on every half. So I do think that's exactly, I, I think of, um, you know, the right to be forgotten is another, you know, when we talk about free speech, that's another case where, you know, in Europe they uh, have this rule that basically says you have the right to, when you've been kind of, you've served your, done something wrong, you've served your time, you have a right to sort of not have it be uh, talked about you that way, that you, that, you know, if you did something 20 years ago, it shouldn't be the first thing you see on Google. And, but again, Wikipedia, who I remember discussing this with the executive director of Wikipedia, they very much don't like that. They're an encyclopedia. They, if you committed a, you know, a bank let's not say bank robbery, even something else is maybe more went, declared bankruptcy 20 years ago. That's a fact. It's part of your biography. It should be in there. How dare you say we can't uh, put that in? But I do think that's another reasonable regulation on recognizing how the internet is different than uh, a newspaper or a court record. Like in the old days, we had these things were very. Uh, there were no limits and, and things were published, but it was very hard to go to the court to find out what happened, who declared bankruptcy. If you went that effort, okay, you could find out 20 years ago I declared bankruptcy, but now it's immediately the first thing that's said about you. You have to sort of bend, you know, you have to adapt for that and that, that's a different definition of free speech, I, you know, I, I think, so. Yeah, I would take it one step further, which is um, I think part of what you're getting at is like what's at stake here is the legitimacy of these companies and and individuals to govern and rule us, right? Like they're, as institutions, we've kind of opted in to living in their worlds. And those are very different worlds from like the traditional transnational, like Westphalian view of the world, right? Um, and that's particularly interesting, especially when we're talking about like Zuckerberg's aspirations um, specifically to, you know, understand that he has built like the largest <laughs> or you know, beginning to be the largest like um, community, community right. Yeah. Huh. Um, so I, I feel like that kind of political term legitimacy is really operative here to mm. say like, did we sign up for this actually? Are these the leaders? Are these the ideas that we um, believe in? And if not, what do we do about that? And um, my last point here is that my, my hope uh, exists on the EU and the GDPR and the um, so. The, What's the GDPR? GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation, oh. um, which is coming out or applies in I think May 2018. Um, this is data protection, um, and but the big thing here is that any company that serves EU citizens could potentially serve somebody visiting, or an EU citizen visiting the United States. So like it applies blanket to basically any company, especially all these ones we're talking about, mm. if they operate and serve EU citizens. Um, that is like the best hope for any solid regulation. Um, and I think it's a kind of least common denominator situation where you know, in the same way that cars are manufactured to meet the highest standards, mm. um, California, um, I think we're going to see that kind of level of regulation. Obviously, it's a little easier to um, change a user experience based on geography, so that's kind of a, a trickier mm. loophole element of this, but um, I am hopeful that that's at least pushing the conversation in the right direction. So again, you're looking to Germany for the, to lead yeah, us well, to, in the as the world yeah. leader in the yeah. EU, yeah. Hi. Hello. I Everything you, I had so many thoughts um, while you all were talking because this is my life and all the um, articles you brought up and all the people you named or. Give us all your thoughts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna it's say, it's I'm been sorry. Yeah. I am okay. a yeah. software engineer and product manager who used to work in the Bay Area and is now at Berkman with Sarah, um, focusing on the social responsibility of my field, which is tech and engineering, um, and also the intersection of tech and government. and. How do we get policy people to understand technology, but also how do we get technologists even a sliver of interest <laughs> in what's going on over in DC, not only to make our government better, but also to impact policies in ways that maybe um, folks in the Silicon Valley can also respect and, and care about. Um, but what I, so I wrote down notes because I knew I would just start rambling and lose my train of thought. Um, I had, on the first point of, um, harassment, diversity, and tech, there are a lot of women who've spoken out. They don't get the same kind of coverage um, as maybe the people in the media. 
but um, Kelly Ellis, Ellen Powell, Erica Baker, Susan Fowler, and all the people who spoke out against Justin Kalbeck um, mm -hmm. when he was a VC, and so many other countless um, really, really brave women. I don't know how to really amplify them even more um, and get the same kind of coverage that you see from... Um, yeah, it's not the, enough for them to have Maybe you need medium. women journalists. I mean, we were talking about women journalists, not women, uh, brave women in the field. We were talking yeah. about, you know, and a lot of the stories about uh, media have been women journalists writing about, so... Yeah, um, and then in addition to that, something you said you know, that really stood out to me and then Sarah also talked about was this idea of both not only the market driving decisions, but also this idea of like utopia. You know, you're going to connect all these people and the world's going to be a like, beautiful place of rainbows and unicorns. And it's um, what, and the second part for me, because coming here to this area, this is my first time in Cambridge, I've been here three months, I often hear the narrative, if those people would just stop caring about money, maybe they'll care about users. But on the ground, a lot of the engineers, and some of you engineering students in this room probably, have this deep like, sense of, we're here because we're changing the world. They, Facebook's mission of like, connecting people and Google's do cool things that matter is what drives a lot of these engineers to go there. If you talk to many of the engineers, you're like, what's the average rev or what's the annual revenue for your company? They're like, I don't know. They even put like, their ads and marketing people and, like, over on a different campus, and the like, engineers, here's like, an unlimited pot of money to go do whatever you want. And so in the world where people actually are only driven by money, maybe we can help figure out what to do there. But what do we do when people genuinely believe that what they're doing is so good and that we're at Google because we're going to make the world a safer place because this is where real security happens. Or we're at Google because there's the power and money here to really connect the world and teach someone in developing regions how to farm so they can pull themselves out of pot. Like these deep missions, but then not think about and that, for me, is a much harder thing to put a finger on. But, I mean, it's you, you, but you can even take your anecdote and switch it around and say there's something wrong about demeaning the marketing and advertising people. It's like they're part of your company. Yeah. So the idea of like saying these are, you know, because the, really you're saying that they're they're not they're not of a pure mission like engineers, but it's also they're not as smart as we are, and so they should be over there. And that's another. So part of it is that is that seduction that they. I was very, um, I wonder what you think of this, but I was very struck with the argument of this, that the computer is a closed world. I know you as a programmer. So that you, you, you are in such control there and you can make the rules and it's so mm -hmm. clean and it all makes sense to your mind. And that that's kind of, you know, I, I, maybe it's like uh, unfair, but I like talk about how Zuckerberg, you know, his first program was, was a risk game based on Julius Caesar. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. like he's doing world conquest now in real life. And it's like, who cares what he's doing on the computer? That's, that's fine. But like, it's, it's, that, it's that crossing off the screen to reality that is what the book's really about. And I wonder, were you drawn to programming because of that like closed world where it all kind of made sense? And is that what we're sort of talking about when they talk about rainbows and unicorns? That like they can create a world that is you know, coherent that way? Yeah, no, I, it's, it's so interesting to hear you say that. That wasn't what drew me to the field. I think perhaps there are groups that think of it that way as well. Um, I was drawn in by like the utopia of, wow, I really can help the whole world connect with each other and do all these things. And candidly, studying computer science, um, this was back to what Sarah was saying. What is it that you're graded on in class? It's your algorithms, your how, how great you're right, like some of your theory classes. What is it that people's performance reviews are at these companies? Um, they don't touch on ethics or users. Like all that is 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 separate. So that wasn't what was drew, drew me in. But I definitely think the way we're trained and the way what the way we're um, what's the right word? The way we're graded or our performance reviews at companies definitely gears towards developing a certain way, even if we have um, certain interests in mind. So I don't know how to fix that. It's what I'm I think mm. about all the time. Um, and mean, the is it a question of actual impact, right? Like if that's what you believe you're doing, how do you know that you're doing it? Yeah. Like how do you check that you're doing that? And I don't think most companies have a way of following through on that. And yeah. there's not room for that, right? Like once you finish one product or feature or whatever, you're on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And like how much aside from using it yourself, do you really get to understand yeah. how it's impacting users, how yep. users actually use it? what their experiences are. And you both brought this up, like how do we get people to think very critically about the impact of what we work on? Um, it requires different training, right? Social yeah. science, other skills that are not what these people have. And it's the arrogance of thinking that I'm good at programming, I'm also good at analyzing how my, will, my work will affect the city. Yeah. It's like, why? Why would you be good at that? I mean, it, it doesn't, you know. Yeah. 
And then um, one final, and I'll sit down, I promise. There's, um, you, I would love to even talk to you more know at some point later about your experience covering this field for so long. Mm -hmm. There are definitely these roles that are seen as idols in the tech field, um, mostly men, um, but people who people look to as like people who paved the way. And they're usually in like the hard, quote, real computer science field. So, so the leaders in AI or some of the leaders who wrote, who are the original writers of the, the main algorithm for Google search who weren't there. And when they say stuff, peop people really listen. Things they say aren't usually around ethics or users. They talk about really efficient algorithms and different things like that. So perhaps there are ways we can influence the, the, the leaders that many people listen to to really, I don't know. Yeah, I found it. I mean, the interesting thing doing the book, I was like, I would collect like all the, each saying how smart the other one, other one was, but also like how everyone was insecure about their own intelligence. So you go to Quora and there's like, is Mark Zuckerberg a great programmer? And it's like, of course he is. Anyone could have done that, you know, blah, blah, blah. John McCarthy, who, who was like the central figure in this book, you know, was a mathematics professor at Stanford, assistant professor, passed over for tenure, went to Dartmouth, and then MIT, became a computer scientist, was brought back to Stanford as a full professor, and mathematicians were like, oh, well, the computer science is obviously very easy. This guy couldn't hack it as a mathematician, and suddenly he's like a full professor. So I mean, there's always, no one is secure when you have this world of constantly, everyone's gotta be the smartest. And so I, I but, you know, I hear you. It's like, maybe an idol would be the way to get some change. You know, I have some important person, like, endorse this stuff, yeah for your panel and the insightful conversation. My name is Stefania, I'm a graduate student in Personal Robots Group, and um, I had a quick question around what you mentioned from Lawrence Lessig, um, Sarah. So I really think like a lot of these issues and externalities of scale came to be because of lack of good uh, business models. Um, so one question, and Eric von Hippel here at MIT actually just released a new book about free innovation. First he had democratizing innovation, and then he's like free innovation. So he's like, mm -hmm. how do we think of monetizing value when you're not you know, aiming for acquiring, but actually like how do we create and value the, what we, we create? Um, and do you really think it's gonna become like decentralized blockchain, everyone owns the data, or we're gonna go back to our tribes that are interconnected. Um, like what are the scenarios you're imagining? Because I'm European as well, and it was very interesting. I was just like at a summit of entrepreneurship in Estonia last week, and there was like such a big debate around scale-ups, like the startups that need to scale. And people were really revolting against that, like young people, uh, senior people, everyone was like, really, do we need to scale? Like, is that always the model of success? Mm. Um, so yeah, there was a lot in there, but I'll, I'll, I'm curious what you think. It's great questions. Um, so I think that, again, gets to the optimization question, like, if, is scale the optimization question? I, I think, you know, in, the, in your account of Facebook, it's purely about, like, well, we don't know what the, op, the business model is. Like, they didn't know what the business model was for a very, very long time. But the question was scale and, like, mm. network effects, right? So, and then we'll figure it out, yeah. Right. Yeah. And by the way, like, We'll bring in Sheryl Sandberg, but mm. that's another story. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's really hard for people to like s imagine other formats aside from like, okay, well, you know, maybe Mastodon or maybe um, uh, what's the other one, Diaspora. Like, where? How long have we talked about that since you know it first came out, and we talked about it as like one possible way to disrupt Facebook. Could, could you? Sure. Diaspora, I think, was you know, a distributed, locally hosted social network infrastructure um, to not have any centralized kind of control over information and data. Um, also, I think some of the guys were former Facebook guys. Is that right? Or NYU? I don't know. I forget. Mm, um, and then Mastodon, similarly, I think, but more for like a Twitter model, maybe, if that's a rough, <laughs> a rough description. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing with even thinking about different models like blockchain, blockchain in itself, like, ideologically is a very libertarian, right? Yeah, I mean, the way she, when she's phrasing it is interesting. I hadn't thought about it, that like even the idea of 
you know, tribes that, that, you know, I mean, they're probably make more sense to say that they're communities you belong to where maybe there it's okay to share, but it's, it, it isn't this universality of like, I'm an individual in the world and we're connecting like that. I, I would say the other thing about business models is that, you know, again, not to fall back on regulation, but the idea is that you're supposed to make a penalty for things that are harmful and that's why you don't pollute. Otherwise, it would be a great business model to like chop all the trees down and pollute the river and, you know, you make the most money. So I think it is on us to sort of add the cost to this so that that, that will, I mean, that's, right. that's well, how it to, should work. Ex yeah. To extract the most value too, right? Say again? To uh, extract the most value from that. From from them or what, what they're doing? What that's, gonna, that's the right. alternative. Yeah, right, the right. As opposed to the battle term, right, yeah. So I, I would also add, um, I think it might, one other lever is the like consumer demand side of things, right? So. Even if we, if it's hard to imagine a world without Facebook and Amazon and Google and Apple, what does it look like if we start demanding different versions of those things or different um, features or different, you know, ways of interacting with these companies? And I think that's really hard for people to get their heads around, but you know, is probably the only way that these companies are going to change. So I mean, um, the, the pessimistic view also is that these companies are so big and powerful that it's very hard, to, uh, they're going to stop this from happening. And that, that when you get sat, you know, pessimistic, that's what you think about the power they have to lobby and, and you know, there's such, you know, uh, I mean, I know our president is fond of pointing this out, but that doesn't mean it's wrong that Jeff Bezos owns Washington Post. And it's, it's, it's a, uh, it certainly led to some good things, but it, it's it, an ominous, I think anyone watching ought to be, it's an ominous thing, you know, I, I think it's kind of un, undeniable. So the, the fear that they're so entrenched is definitely a, a problem, I mean. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anne Della Rosa, and I come from the sociological perspective of having delivered mail for 30 years in San Mateo, California, right smack in the middle of Silicon Valley. So you have seen the technology so shift. So I have seen <laughs> the houses go up hundreds of thousands, added any zeros to property, and had you know people that are 30 years old and work for Google and work for Facebook and work for whatever come into these neighborhoods and buy the houses and the people get pushed out from those houses are the people that are now the contract workers that help support Facebook and Google. And these are not, not just the, the advertising people that you spoke of, but the people that work in the cafeteria, the people that drive the drive cleaning cars that bring the cleaning to these people so they can work 15, 20 hours a day. And none of them are Apple or Facebook employees. And they are not right? their employees, yeah. even though they spend full time there. Yet they have to like spend more time on the internet getting drawn in to say, can you pick up another shift? Yet you can't go over 40 hours because then we might have to pay you benefits. We might have to pay you. So the fact that there's a disconnect between like the, the Zuckerberg Foundation, the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation. Right now, I read an article about how they're uh, trying to work on this homeless problem. Well, one of the people I know that is actually homeless is somebody that lost the benefits from a job and couldn't and only has part-time. So they only value the core center of, their, of who they are, but they don't have any value of the people that truly support the company, all the outside workers. I think. Maybe MIT probably does have adjunct professors, but I bet you the person that's working in the boiler room is an MIT employee and probably gets full benefits. And the lack of benefits is destroying the middle class. Um, and isn't it peculiar that's they have the so total much lack of humanity, I think. But they have so much wealth. That's what's very peculiar about it. You feel like they could at least take care of their own. I mean, you, you, I mean we're, we're talking about the societal effects, but right. this is their immediate backyard. It's really... But they're, Staggering. I think the, the most common argument that they make is like, well, our core business is not the cafeteria and cleaning. Like that w we, as these companies, are going to do only our core business. And like- but That's the exact, right. of course, of no, course. Earlier, right. That the, the business plan isn't developed. My, my niece worked for a, a startup company. She was number eight. Well, I mean, she had to travel to Paris and stay in a room with five other guys where she was sexually assaulted by one of them. But this was before the company had a PR department, sure. or an HR department, sorry, an HR department where you learned what the rules were. So a lot of these startups are very rogue, and yet they don't understand how it is to value everyone. But, but even think about the logic of saying that it's not part of our core business. It's like, well, how are you having food? I mean, like, uh, what, how are you? How is the, the hall, halls being clean? And I, I, in the in the book, I talk about the uh, there's a this philosopher uh, Susan Muller Oaken who argued that basically libertarianism uh, 
is anti-feminist by definition. It's like not a coincidence mm -hmm. that it's all tech bros because basically it, it, Where it's does the individual yeah, come, come from? from? It's based on this fiction that like that you could be a Google employee, but the food just shows up magically. Or so I mean, but libertarianism is kind of ar the argument: you show up in life, you're uh, uh, an adult male, you don't owe any debt to anyone who raised you, <coughs> the community that raised you. You just it's like then it all makes sense. I would at least agree that. Um, Libertarianism would make sense if you felt it was a fair playing field. If your ideology is that hard work is what you should reward, okay, that might make sense. But we what know it's not a fair it's not a fair right. playing field. So by definition, it's like it's a faulty but logic. But that it kind of is predicated on, on devaluing women and the role of family and women in 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 getting us here to adulthood. So your niece is that what you're talking about? Right. Did she? <coughs> what happened to her after? Did she end up staying she, within she technology? She stayed with the company and and um, really talked with. You know who they. She was in on interviewing who they hired for the HR department, mm -hmm. and and uh, that person did get fired, um, just by a conversation. But she was really worried about actually losing her job and didn't. Right. So that's a good thing, but probably because she was really good at her job and it was like he maybe wasn't as much, but it it, it shouldn't have happened. But there weren't the the things set in place. But this is one thing I think could possibly be a way to like bring everybody around is like if all of the Amazon drivers that are hired right now for the holidays, if like December 23rd, they all went on strike, mm. <laughs> didn't take a shift, people would be like, oh my gosh, what am I, you know? Yeah. yeah. They tried this in Germany on Black Friday. Um, you know, sorry, but it's, you know, it's the last battle. I mean, labor, labor unions, I think, are the counter effect. They are our hope in that sense, it's true. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Max. I'm a undergraduate in mechanical engineering and part of the personal robotics group. As an engineer who's really interested in user-centered design and getting into that, um, in particular how design conversations have to change for different users, I've noticed that a lot of the conversations tend to be stuck in either academia or these design firms, and that's where a lot of these conversations kind of exist. Like even in my capstone class, the a huge emphasis they put on user experience and user design is great, but then the shift between the jobs that people end up taking and um, the frameworks of the jobs end up taking is kind of like very stark to me. And I was wondering, like, as somebody who's going into uh, engineering field and wanting to be a professional in this, or like people, all of us here as consumers, like, how do we see that shift in thinking in these larger companies? That's a great question. I mean, I think the best way to get in is to like make that a business case, right? Like this is going to lead to better experiences and better, you know, uh, better user like value, right? Um, I think the question is how to speak their language and put a number on it or, you know, integrate it into the, the kind of way that they want to value their, their process and their, you know, development. I don't know. It, I mean, it's a tough question. I think, I think it's also just a question of like where finding those people in the in institutions themselves and in, in the companies themselves who are thinking like that and have been influenced in those ways, um, or just working outside of it, right? Like Tristan Harris leaves Google to kind of advocate on a large scale to influence a bunch of designers to be asking these questions in their you know institutions from the bottom up, right? Um, I think that's arguably the most effective <laughs> way um, to to kind of have the ethics from the bottom up. So, thank you. Hi, thank you guys for the work you do to bring this these very important issues to light. Um, my name is Aiden. I am a um, resident fellow at Harvard Divinity School, so shout out to the <laughs> chaplain over here. There's not a lot of us who come into these rooms, um, but I actually- Thank you for coming, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I worked on tech policy in the Obama administration, so I'm kind of a weird hybrid person. Um, worked with Kathy well, over there. We need all of these hybrid people. That's yeah. like, that is what is missing. Yeah, so, that, so my question is sort of related to that. I mean, um, one thing that I think a lot about is um, during the Obama administration, we did a lot of work to bring all these techies into government in part because it's like, all right, well, if you want things to change, then come join us, right? And so I'm thinking about this norms question, this how do we interrogate our own products, um, and if it's even realistic to talk about having teams that are within the you know, leadership of some of these companies whose job it is precisely to do that, to think about what are the effects on humanity, what is the justice 
lens of this stuff because there is an element of if you're not if that's not your job to do it, there, it's like a frog in boiling water problem of like you just you forget that how how to look at those things, right? Or you tell yourself it's easy to kind of um, to believe the narrative of we're here and we're changing the world in these ways or those ways, or even if the product the sort of aspect of the product that you're working on maybe is connecting people to education who wouldn't otherwise have it, your job is not to look at a macro level at how the overall company is influencing the direction of things. And so should we, those of us who are, are talking about these issues, it strikes me that a lot of us should talk about joining the companies themselves, but I also wonder if that sounds idealistic, that like people could actually be empowered in those roles. Like what would it take for Mark Zuckerberg to say, yes, we want a team that does this. It would mean having the humility to admit that like right now they're not doing those things. So that's... I mean, I think they're certainly thinking about it right now, um, mm -hmm. at least from a kind of oversight perspective for a bunch of different reasons, but um, maybe not quite to the, to the level of like having a chief, you know, human experience mm. officer or some, you know, some version of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is why it's really important to not only look at the individuals in charge and the Zuckerbergs, but also to look at the systemic um, support systems around them. Like, what is the institutional uh, org chart for Facebook, right? Like, that matters um, for Google, that matters. And how does that change over time? That also really matters as these companies scale, as they get bigger, as they start touching more things, right? Um, and I think that is, and aside from like trolling LinkedIn, like how, how do we as a public get to look into that? Um, maybe the shareholder like 10K has a little bit of insight into that, but probably not much. Um, yeah. Is there anything in response to agitation? So I, I think it, it, the book was, you know, didn't dwell on this, but a major absence is like lack of a labor movement and that that, that is what, there need to be these checks. And I, believe me, there could be, a, I'm sure, a long litany of why labor unions are inefficient, but that they serve as a very valuable, when you see the, the whole of society, you see that you could see labor unions as being efficient, inefficient and, and, and giving bad incentives or whatever the criticism would be, but they serve this vital role to check these companies and like they're not going to do it voluntarily. Like we're saying, it's not going to be self-regulation. It's not going to be them appointing someone to serve this role. It's only in, rea in reaction to the bad press and the yeah. valid concern about the election that's leading to some change. If there's agitation about lack of diversity, that could lead to some change. If there were an actual labor union that that could that would actually be able to strike and really affect the balance of power, that's the only thing that, that are going to I think make them change. And it's not beyond the realm of possibility that would happen. That's but that, I think you expect. Uh, an org chart or somehow to reflect that, it, it won't happen voluntarily because I think they think they are doing the best. That, that's why I was, if any message of the book was that they think they are doing the best job with user experience and they will say, look how successful they are, that is how I know I'm doing a great job. And you know, you're talking about ethics or whatever these things are. Like, go back to the example of the Google designer. He was saying, I have a vision for Google. I have a human, my vision for how it should look. I'm a designer, I study this. And they're like, we're going to just test it. Then And people are going to like what we do. And that's, I mean, it's just like, they're not speaking the same language, I would say. It doesn't compute, I would say. What we're talking about doesn't compute. <laughs> yeah, you know? no, I think that makes yeah. sense. It strikes me, though, that maybe now we're at a moment when they can no longer say we're a morally neutral platform. And so we don't need people whose job it is to think mm -hmm. about these things. Um, but again, that may be naive of me. It just seems like if, if there's a moment to push on it, mm. this maybe is the For Yeah, sure. absolutely. Time. Thank you well, so much. Oh, oh. I, was, I would just add, like, you know, there's all, any product goes through, okay, like, the lawyers have to do the check box, right? Like, is this, before you ship, like, the lawyers are the last step, right? And engineers hate this because it's like, oh, we built all this stuff and, like, now the lawyers are saying we can't do it. Or, like, it's because it's not integrated into the process. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I, so imagine that, but, like, not just lawyers integrated into the process, <laughs> but, like, experience, ethicists, ethicists oh right? Like, God. who are those people? Yeah. How do they get hired? Yeah. Um, this is like huge case for hum human. What were their calculus scores? You know, I mean, yeah. Right. What huge case for the um, humanists to find jobs in these companies? Um, it's not just the engineers that we need. So. And last question. You've been waiting so patiently. Mm. Thank you. Hi, my name is Heather, and I'm a lawyer, but not one of the lawyers you were talking about. Um, and the thing that 
has struck me is that what we study in law school largely is how the rules got there and why we have them. And the internet seems to be a giant erasure of history and why we do things. Because um, you know, I know lots of engineers and the general mindset of engineers is we can figure out anything. And so that means that expertise is not valued because we can always learn it. We have all this information out here, but they've forgotten the part about um, bad information is not helpful. And so when you have a platform that has no way for you to tell what's good information and what's bad information, you make bad decisions. And you know, the, in my corporations class, the first thing we studied was taxi cabs. Not, be, not actually the Uber issue, really, but more that what they used to do to avoid liability was one car, one corporation, 10 cents in the bank. And so on, that's, that's why we have the rule of piercing the corporate veil. If you don't capitalize your corporation, then guess what? You don't get the benefit. And we're losing all of this. Um, because we have all of these people who are so much smarter than everybody else that they've decided they don't need it. Well, and, and they're also well, really right? young, yeah. and they haven't lived, and they haven't seen that there are reasons for why we do things a particular way. And yes, we should re-examine them periodically, but we should recognize that there is a reason yeah, there's a, you ever hear this uh, thing called the Chesterton Gate? You know, say G.K. Chesterton talked about the idea that you walk in a, a field and you see a gate there and you're just like, well, it makes no sense in the middle of a field. You know, obviously I'll just tear it down. And, and he's saying you should at least have the humility to go, someone put it there. There was probably some reason. Like, I, I don't know that it's the right reason, but like it, things don't just ran, they have some respect for, like you're saying, history and context. And he came out, I think, from a, like a right-wing perspective, a very conservative perspective, criticizing George Bernard Shaw and like, you could see why it's fundamentally a lot of what we're talking about is pretty conservative values and that in reality these libertarians I'm talking about are highly, highly radical. I mean, you know, in a sense like you know, not since we've seen since like, you know, the, the Russian Revolution or something that the lack of respect for institutions and for history and, and this belief that progress is this mysterious thing that happen instantaneously. So I think, we, I think we, the stakes are very high and sometimes it's easy to get confused by what, what's being pushed forward, but it's really a, a scary dangerous uh, ideology, and that's what I was trying to say in the book, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would just add that, you know, to, to address the kind of allergy to regulation, you know, that's a perfect example, right? Like, there's a reason the taxis are regulated or, you know, have rules around them. Um, this is the kind of Uber model, right? Like, well, we're just going to make it more efficient. Like, that's all we're trying to do. Um, so regulations of taxis in local jurisdictions don't matter, right? Like that was quite literally like the words that came out of Travis Kalanakis's mouth. Um, but we all know where he has ended up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> but all of that is to say, like, it's worth acknowledging that like technology has politics and like there are, you know, the, the libertarian stance is such that it's like, I'm just apolitical. Like this is, this is efficient. This is you know markets driven. There is no politics involved. And I think what we can really push against is like yes, there are politics involved. It's you know to call it out and call it a spade a spade. I was telling my editor that like there is the line from the band Rush that says you know if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. And as you were saying, they said, well, actually, it was Pascal who said that. But uh, <laughs> so maybe it's a little more uh, weighty that way. But uh, th that's the myth that they th believe they're not making any decisions, but in fact, they're making huge yeah. decisions. Well, and, and additionally, the way you ask a question has an answer embedded in it. Absolutely. Um, I mean, that's what you learn in legal writing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming.
coming out. And uh, again, this is one last reminder before we give a big round of applause to our speakers. Um, uh, Gnome's book um, is up here for sale. I cannot recommend it uh, highly enough. Uh, so please go and buy it. And our mailing list, if you are interested in hearing about further communications forums, uh, is right over here. Please join me in giving a really big round of applause.